So let's look at this review for our unit test over stoichiometry. Make sure that you know your definitions. Make sure that you can write those out because this, te this test is all write out. There's no multiple choice or anything. It's all about can you show the work, write out these problems, give me those answers in unit sig figs and scientific notation. So know stoichiometry and how to spell it. Limiting reagent, excess reagent. There's only three definitions. It shouldn't be that hard to know those three definitions. Now these problems, there will be examples of each of these types of problems on the test. Use your techniques for solving these problems. The first thing you want to do is what you've always done. Read the problem, circle what you're trying to find, underline what it gives you. So in this first part it asks how many moles of aluminum sulfate can be formed from the reaction of 2.5 moles of copper 2 sulfate. So it looks like we're looking at the copper 2 sulfate as our known. So we've got 2.5 moles of that. And our moles of aluminum sulfate is our unknown. Remember we X'd out. Now I'm not going to be grading for these extra things, Xing out. Um, and I'm not even going to be grading for writing your um, brackets for your mole ratio, but you'd be really wise to do that. So underlining those to remind ourselves that that's what we use for a mole ratio. We've got three moles of copper sulfate, copper two sulfate to be exact, for every one mole of aluminum sulfate. So there's the mole ratio. We always start with what we've got underlined over one. So we've got 2.5 moles of copper two sulfate over one. Since we started with one with moles, remember we are always going to use the mole ratio as soon as possible and we're already ready to use it. We know that moles of copper sulfate go on the bottom. So it looks like based on our mole ratio that we need three with the moles of copper sulfate and the one mole of aluminum sulfate on top. And when we get done, moles of copper sulfate are going to cancel. We're going to be left with moles of aluminum sulfate. And that's what we're trying to find. So when we take 2.5 divided by 3, since it's on the bottom, we get the two sig figs, 8.3, times 10 to the negative first moles of aluminum sulfate. So that's our answer. Now it has to be in unit sig figs and scientific notation. And if you're still having problems with that, you need to go back to our first problems dealing with dimensional analysis back in unit two and review on how to write those in um, scientific notation. So I'm not going to spend time on this review dealing with that part. The next one asks us how many grams of aluminum are needed to produce 125 grams of copper. So in this case, we've got a new unknown grams of aluminum, or what is what we're trying to find. It gives us 125 grams of copper. I'm going to go back up into that original equation and label it in red. So we've got X grams of aluminum, and I'm going to erase off our X's because this time those aren't X'd out for this part of the problem. If that kind of confuses you, rewrite the equation when you're taking the test. It's no big deal. So X grams of aluminum and 125 grams of copper, and this time we're not dealing with the copper sulfate and aluminum sulfate. So when we do our mole ratio, we will have two moles of aluminum for every three moles of copper. Very similar mole ratio to the one you used when you were doing your lab, this recent lab that we just got done with. So now we're going to start the problem with what we know, which is 125 grams of copper. Now this time we have grams. We can't use the mole ratio yet because we need to be converting this to moles first. So we look up the molar mass of copper. We see that it's 63.55 grams of copper per mole. And now that we have canceled our grams of copper and we're left with moles of copper, now we can use our mole ratio. 
we know that we need moles of copper on the bottom, and based on that red mole ratio at the top on the left up there, it looks like we need three moles with the copper and two moles with aluminum. Are we done yet? Well, we've got moles of copper canceled, and we're left with moles of aluminum, but that's not what it asks for. It asks for grams. So we know that, no, we are not done. We need to use our table grams or molar mass conversion factor to convert this to grams. So we look up aluminum, aluminum and we see that it's 26.98 grams per mole. And that there, therefore cancels moles of aluminum. Looks like I just put moles of A, moles of aluminum. We're left with grams of aluminum and that is what we circled in the problem. So when we work this out, remember in the calculator it's going to be 125 divided by 63.55 times 2 divided by 3 times 26.98, putting that in our calculator. So make sure that you put it in the calculator correctly. We need this to three sig figs, so our answer ends up in scientific notation to be 3.54 times 10 to the first grams of aluminum. You should have ended up with something like 35.4 something or 0.3 something in your calculator. So rounded correctly, the correct number of sig figs and scientific notation, this is your answer. Okay, so two other conversion factors that you're going to have to memorize because we're not going to give those to you. I'm going to write them down up here. You need to know that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Remember those particles can be atoms, molecules, or formula units. Any of those will work per one mole of whatever substance you're dealing with. The other one that we need to memorize is that there's 22.4 liters of a substance, a gas, at STP for every one mole of that gas. So those are the two conversion factors that you're going to need to memorize, so make sure you do that. Okay, so in this next problem, it tells us that we have 100 grams of aluminum oxide and that we want to know how many atoms of aluminum we can get from that decomposition. So let's label. We've got 100 grams of aluminum oxide, and it's asking us to find X atoms of aluminum. So it looks like we need a conversion factor between those two. So we have the fact that there are two moles of aluminum oxide for every four moles, almost put a three, four moles of aluminum. And now we're ready to start the problem. We started with what we've got underlined, 100.0 grams of aluminum oxide. And of course, since it's in grams, we can't use the mole ratio yet. We need to get that converted to moles. Add up two aluminums and three oxygens together. Practice doing this and making sure you come up with 101.96 grams of aluminum oxide per mole. Now grams cancel. We're left with moles of aluminum oxide. So now we can use the mole ratio. We want moles of aluminum oxide on bottom. And from our mole ratio, looks like it's two moles of aluminum oxide for every four moles of aluminum. And now it's when we have to be very careful. Our, we are going to want to put grams here because we've done so many problems like that. But this is when we need to really watch what we have put up here. And we put X atoms for our unknown. So we need to change this, convert this to atoms. So we've canceled moles. We've got moles of aluminum which is an element, so we're looking at 6.02, Avogadro's number, times 10 to the 23rd, atoms of aluminum for every mole of aluminum. And that's going to cancel our moles, leave us with atoms. So if we're dealing with atoms or molecules, make sure you're using Avogadro's number for that conversion factor. Make sure you know it. So when we plug this into our calculator, practice with that 6.02 E23. 
Be careful on that one or you'll plug it into your calculator incorrectly. To, th um, to three sig figs, it looks like our answer comes out to be 1.18 times 10 to the 24th atoms of aluminum. Now, again, be careful because I can't begin to tell you the number of students who have put just to the 1.18 because they miss that there's multiple numbers as it's being carried out across the calculator screen and they miss that E24 at the end. The moral of the story, always look at the end of the screen in the calculator. Make sure you don't have an E something. Also, make it make sense. Does 1.18 atoms make any sense? No, it doesn't. 1.18 times 10 to the 24th is a lot of atoms, but that makes some sense. So keep that in mind. Okay, the next one, how many liters of oxygen would be formed? So now we've got a different problem asking for a different unknown, liters of oxygen. Now, I've still got my 100.0 grams of aluminum oxide. I don't want to use the 1.18 times 10 to the 24th atoms that I just found because it's a calculated value. And I, if I made a mistake on that, I would have a mistake on this now. So I always want to go back to my original given, the 100 grams. But this time, I'm looking for X liters of oxygen. So I need a mole ratio between these two. So I need two moles of aluminum oxide, it's kind of getting a little crowded up here, but I think you can see what I'm writing, for every three moles of oxygen. So there's my mole ratio for this particular problem. So let's start the problem with what I have originally underlined, the 100.0 grams of aluminum oxide. The nice thing about this is I already know it's molar mass because I already looked it up. Just make sure you got it right the first time. So one mole of aluminum oxide for every 101.96 grams of aluminum oxide. And now that I have my units, my grams canceled, I'm left with moles, I can use my mole ratio. And I need moles of aluminum oxide on the bottom, so the two moles of Al2O3 go on the bottom. The three moles of oxygen on top from my mole ratio I just wrote down. That's going to cancel moles of aluminum oxide, leave us with moles of oxygen. Again, being careful to always double check what my X is. My X is liters. So which conversion factor am I going to need to use? I need the 22.4 liters per mole. Moles of oxygen have to go on bottom and Remember, one always goes with mole in our um, three conversion factors that we've been using for the past several units. So one mole of oxygen for every 22.4 liters of oxygen. That will cancel moles. I'll be left with liters. Now, I have to admit, this problem could be stated better because I really should have set up here that this is at STP because this 22.4 liters per mole is only true at STP, and we'll learn standard temperature and pressure. We'll learn more about that in a later unit, but I just want to point that out. So working through this problem now, I see that I do have liters as my final answer. I need three sig figs because of this 22.4. Only has three sig figs. So my answer ends up being 3.30 times 10 to the first liters of oxygen. You would have gotten 33 point something in your calculator rounded to sig figs and scientific notation. That's your answer. Okay, so let's move on. Extend this page out so we can have more room to write our problems. So disulfur dichloride can be made by allowing chlorine gas to react with molten sulfur, so it gives us this reaction. If you begin with 6.35 grams of chlorine and you isolate only 9.73 grams of disulfur dichloride, what is the percent yield? As soon as I see that statement, the very first thing that I suggest you do is to skip some room so you can write your theoretical yield and go down here and put your percent yield calculation or equation. Percent yield, and you've got to know this equation, make sure you know it, is the experimental yield 
over the theoretical yield times 100. And my challenge to you before you ever start the problem is to find out how much they got in the end, how much they found in the end, their experimental yield, and write that in first off. Now it says we begin with 6.35 grams of chlorine. That is not what we end up with, obviously. That's what we began with. It says we isolate only 9.73 grams. That's the value. That's our experimental yield. And they may word it differently. They may say we actually obtained, we only obtained, or something like that. But find that number and fill it in. And once you do that, exit out because you're not going to use it for anything else in this problem. So make sure you do that first off. Now we can go back and use what we began with, the 6.35 grams of chlorine. I'm not sure why I'm writing it over sulfur, but the 6.35 grams of chlorine. And now we can look for our disulfur dichloride. The only thing that could be disulfur dichloride is this one. So that's what we're looking for for our theoretical yield. And once we find our theoretical yield, it's going to go here. So let's find that real quick. We've got 6.35 grams of chlorine. And we have molar mass of 70.90 grams of chlorine per mole of chlorine. Now we've got a 4 to 4 relationship here. So it looks like we've got, and you can go ahead and write that, 4 moles of chlorine as a, as a mole ratio up here for every 4 moles of disulfur dichloride. The numbers are the same, so it's not really going to change the calculation, but it does let us switch substances. So we've got our grams of chlorine canceled, our moles of chlorine canceled. We're at moles of S2Cl2. We need grams, so add up two sulfurs and two chlorines. Guys, be careful about your molar masses. That's where everybody messes up. Double check those and make sure you're studying and practicing doing those so you don't make a mistake on those in your, uh, when you're working. We end up with 12.095 grams of H2Cl2. Now, if they ask you 4% yield, or excuse me, if they ask you for the theoretical yield, then you'll want to go in and get this incorrect sig fix. I'm going to put this because you don't need it because it did not ask us to find it. We are going to use it. But I will say that if this had to be reported, it would be three sig figs, and it would have been this. But it did not ask for it on the review. It might ask for it on the test, but it did not on the review. So just keep in mind that if it does, you'll want to report it USS. But that number is what goes in here on the bottom, 12.095 grams. We really don't want to round it when we put it in the problem. Times 100, we end up with a percent yield of 80 point, uh, looks like 80.4 for our percent yield. I've also got 80.5 on my review as a possible answer, so chances are that if somebody rounded this, you might come out with a slightly different answer. Okay, so there's those problems. Now, the next one Ask how many grams of nitrogen can be formed when 125 grams of ammonia are reacted with 155 grams of nitrogen monoxide. So we've got ammonia and nitrogen monoxide, and it's asking us to find grams of nitrogen. So 125 grams of ammonia, 155 grams of nitrogen monoxide, X grams of nitrogen, don't care about the water. Now, what are we dealing with here? As soon as it gives us two reactant masses or two values for the reactants, 
we're dealing with a limiting reagent problem. So the first thing we've got to do is find the limiting reagent. Remember to do that, we have to find the moles of each of the substances involved. So 125 grams of NH3, and the fact that there is 17.04 grams of NH3 per mole, That gives us 7.336 moles of NH3. We also have 155 grams of NO. We have one mole of NO for every 30.01 grams. Gives us 5.165 moles of our NO. So we've got this much NH3, we've got this much NO. Now be careful. We have to remember the step that has us divide by our coefficients. NH3 has to be divided by 4, NO has to be divided by 6. Otherwise we're liable to pick the wrong limiting reagent. We end up with 1.83 moles for our NH3. We end up with 0.861 moles for our NO. This is our smallest value now, so it looks like nitrogen monoxide is the limiting reagent. So that's the answer. Make sure you write it out in words. So be a really good idea to label it. This is the limiting reagent, so this is the excess reagent. Now, regardless of what it has on your test, I expect you to do all of the parts. I expect you to do the find the limiting reagent, find the product, and then find the excess reagent. So now that we know the limiting, we know that that's the one we have to start with. So we're going to start both of our next two problems with 155 grams of NO. Now this is the one where we're going to be comparing our limiting reagent with our unknown. So this, is, this part is finding our unknown. Let me just label that. So this is the unknown. Always start with the limiting reagent, now go to the unknown. So we're looking at, again, 30.01 grams of NO per mole. Make sure you get the molar mass of that one right the first time, or that's going to be really messy as we go through this problem. We're looking for the relationship this time, remember, between our NO and our nitrogen. So looks like we've got a 6 mole of NO for every five moles of N2 relationship here. And it wanted grams, so now we need to get this in grams. And it looks like there's um, 28.02 grams of nitrogen for every mole of nitrogen. So it looks like our final answer here to three sig figs is that we get 1.21 times 10 to the second grams of nitrogen. So you probably, in, or so in your calculator, you got either 120 point something or 121 point something as your answer. Rounding it in sig figs, this is what we come up with. Our last part then is to find our excess reagent. Now we're going to be comparing, once again, still always starting with the limiting reagent, but this time we're comparing it to our excess. So those are the two that we're going to be comparing this time with a 4 to 6 relationship for our mole ratio. So starting the same way, So now, the board was glitching a little bit, so hopefully I fixed this. We have 155 grams of nitrogen monoxide. We're going to have the 30.01 grams of NO at the bottom again for every one mole. 
Okay, no. And this time we're comparing it to the excess reagent, remember. So we've got um, a 6 to 4 relationship, remember. We saw that up here. So the NO is 6, so we've got 6 moles of NO. Board is still glitching a little bit, but hopefully it'll let me get through this. And 4 moles of our NH3. And now we need it in grams, so we've got 17.04 grams of NH3 for every mole. And we get 58.7 grams of NH3 used. Now that's important, that use is important because that means we're not done with this problem yet. The very last step is to take what we had to start with of our NH3, which was 125 grams, and subtract this off. So I'm kind of running low on room, but hopefully you can read this. We've got 125 grams of our NH3 minus the 58.7 grams of NH3, and we end up with 66.3 grams, and that ends up giving us a 6.63 times 10 to the first grams of NH3 in excess. Kind of ran out of room there, but that's our answer. So you cannot forget that subtraction step or you're going to have the wrong answer. People stop with the 58.7 all the time. You've got to subtract. It didn't ask us how much was used. It asked us how much was left over. Okay, so let's try the last problem. We're going to hope that the, the glitch will let us write this one because this is our longest problem. It says that we've got quinone, which is used in the dye industry is an organic compound that contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So that's going to let us know what our formula consists of for this unknown compound. It is combustion. We know we're going to be reacting that with oxygen, and we're going to be forming CO2 and H2O. So now we can label it with the information it gives us. It tells us that we have 0 0.257 grams of our original substance and that when it burns it gives us 0 0.0350 grams of water. And, oh, I'm sorry, I did that incorrectly. That's not what it told us. It told us that we had 0 0.105 grams of the compound. And it produced 0 0.257 grams of the carbon dioxide. So that's what we begin with. So now our puzzle pieces, remember, that we want to find are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen down here. So we want to find carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So let's just start with our carbon. We've got 0 0.257 grams of CO2. Molar mass of that is 44.01 grams of CO2 per mole. Then we have a relationship within CO, CO2 of one carbon for every molecule. So there's going to be one mole of carbon in every mole of CO2. And then, of course, our 12.01 grams of carbon per mole. This is going to give us 0 0.07013 grams of carbon. There's our first puzzle piece. So we're going to put that down here. Now we're going to do the same thing for hydrogen. We've got 0 0.0350 grams of hydrogen, or grams of water, excuse me, 
Molar mass of water is 18.02 grams per mole. Now, watch this. This is where people make their, the mistake. Notice that in water there are two hydrogens. There are two moles of hydrogen for every one water, one mole of water. So watch that relationship because it's where people make the most mistakes is right there. And since it's just H here, just H, it's going to be 1.01 .01 grams of hydrogen per mole. Yeah, if it was H2, we'd do 2.02, .02, but it's just H. So that gives us 0 0.003923. grams of hydrogen. There's our next puzzle piece. 0 0.003923 grams. And finally to get that last piece of the puzzle, we're going to get oxygen, which means we're going to take this amount right here, our 0 0.105 grams total, and if we subtract off the carbon that we just found and subtract off the hydrogen that we just found, then we will get how much must be oxygen and it comes out to be 0 0.03095 grams of oxygen. And we now have our final piece of the puzzle. 0 0.03095 grams. So now we're ready to do our empirical formula part of this problem. So we're going to divide these by their molar masses. So I'm going to divide this by 12.01 grams per mole for carbon. Divide by 1.01 grams per mole for hydrogen. 16.00 grams per mole for oxygen. Remember, we don't double those. They're not diatomic when they're in a compound. They're just their normal atomic masses. When we do that, we get 0 0.005839 moles of carbon, 0 0.003884 moles of hydrogen, and 0 0.001934 moles of oxygen. To get that into a useful whole number ratio, we're going to divide all three of those by the smallest of those numbers, the 0 0.001934. And when we do, we get 3.0 for carbon, 2.0 for hydrogen, and 1.0 for our oxygen. That gives us a formula for this compound of C3H2O1, understood. So we don't put ones in formulas or symbols, and that's the answer to that problem.